Hello and welcome to the latest NatWest Markets U.S. Election Watch podcast. I'm Brian Dangerfield, the head of G10FX Strategy for the U.S. And I'm John Briggs, head of Strategy for the Americas. In today's podcast, we're going to focus on geopolitical developments and take a step back uh, from the day-to-day headlines and the nitty-gritty of the race. But before we do that, we feel it's imperative that we do touch on some of the developments that have happened really in the past week, because both betting markets and polling have shifted pretty dramatically over that time. So John, why don't you give us a quick rundown on what's happened over the past week or so, and then we'll touch on geopolitics, foreign policy, and trade policy under uh, a Biden or Trump presidency. Yeah, look, and, and, and I'll be brief. I mean, it's pretty clear that Trump's falling further behind and time's running out. Biden's now ahead by 10 on national polling averages. His swing, Trump's swing state deficits to Biden are widening. And we always thought this was Biden's to lose, but if Trump doesn't get some momentum soon, it may be over. Um, and, I, and I say that because already we're seeing a huge amount of votes um, already being cast, around 20%, for example. I mean, even in Georgia, you've got 11 hour lines in the last couple of days. The amount of early voting that's happening is massive. And this voting is happening at a time where voters see uh, Biden as the preferred candidate. Um, you know, even if we have a late election day swing, it, it might not have as much impact in the past. And interestingly, when you look at mail-in voting, um, the votes so far have favored those sent to Democratic Party affiliation to the GOP almost two to one. And by that, I mean that, um, you know, they can be able to track that if you request a mail-in ballot and you're, you have a, you're registered with the Democratic Party, those ballots that are returned have been favoring those affiliated with Democrats to GOP almost two to one. So again, it's just like a turnout and energy issue. It certainly seems to be favoring at this stage, the Democratic Party. That doesn't mean to say that the Republican mail-in ballots won't all be sent in. Um, but so far, it looks like the momentum is, is there behind the Democrats. Um, so again, the real question that we're focusing on uh, as we go forward into the end, end run here is the Senate, where you know, we've talked about how the base case for us is that the Democrats do take control of the Senate and the path continues to widen there as well. South Carolina, according to Cook Political Report, has now moved to a toss up. And, you know, even the Kansas Senate race is looking like it may be closer than we thought. It's I doubt that the Democrats are going to take the Kansas Senate seat. But Republicans are spending money there. It's within, I don't know, five, six points. This is a state that Trump won by 20 points in 2016. South Carolina, like I said, a toss up. The last Senate race, um, not this candidate, but the last Senate race, which was in 2016, the Republican candidate won by 26 points. And it just shows how much the swing has happened. I think lately it's been two unforced errors have, have helped it, which first is canceling of the debate. And Trump really needed the debate to you know, score some wins against Biden. And, but taking that off the calendar was, I think, problematic. And then canceling the stimulus negotiations. Now they've come back to discuss that with the Democrats and, and he's trying to now go bigger and, and shift the narrative. But, you know, those were two kind of unforced errors, I think, that's not going to help him. So, look, he's just fallen further behind. And it's why I think that, you know, as we we head into the discussion, this topic of today's podcast, um, I can hand for you to set the stage, you know, probably should spend a little bit more time on what a Biden foreign policy would look like rather than a Trump one. So I'll start right there talking about geopolitics and let's think about the overall orientation. Importantly, the Senate obviously matters a lot for legislative control. We've talked about that several times in this forum. Um, And, you know, as you mentioned, Democrats have um, a widening path towards potentially getting a majority in the Senate, but they don't need a majority in the Senate in order for the president to set the geopolitical and trade agenda. We've seen that countless times in the past four years under Trump. And so from a geopolitical perspective, it really matters who the president is. And so let's think about from a broad perspective, President Trump represents unilateralism and the America first doctrine, whereas we think Joe Biden represents a return towards, but not a complete return to Obama era multilateralism. Under President Trump, whose odds of reelection are looking less likely, we think we're gonna see a continuation of more of the same, really continuing to use America's economic and military uh, prowess as almost a, a negotiating piece to try and push other countries to make concessions towards America, whether that be on trade, 
on geopolitical front, on security issues. We've seen that with Chinese tech companies, that kind of thing. We think President Trump continues that stance. If anything, he might push even further in that direction. During his first four years, it wasn't obvious that the trade war had a significant negative impact on the economy um, or on the equity markets. We know that before the COVID crisis, the equity market and the, uh, and the economy were both running quite strong. We think President Trump would continue to use that policy of maximum pressure America first. Under Biden, we think a multilateral stance is likely, but that doesn't necessarily mean one that is a return to a free trade capitalist, uh, capitalist utopia, if you will. Um, we know the Democratic Party um, has generally been more skeptical on the free trade side. Biden's plans uh, on the trade front are not necessarily a complete eschewing of Trump's trade war, and that's especially the case with China. Under President Trump, we know he's been quite upset with China over the past year, calling coronavirus the China virus, escalating on a number of, I would say, relatively peripheral um, issues with China, not necessarily doing the big tariff uh, escalation that we saw a few years ago. But we know that Trump's orientation towards China is to try and rework that relationship in a bilateral way. Under Biden, we actually think that the reworking of the economic relationship between the U.S. and China probably continues not necessarily in a, uh, doesn't necessarily mean a big improvement or a big change, a big pivot in the overall tone of relations. We know that Biden's campaign uh, platform includes a number of, uh, uh, quite a bit of rhetoric that could be mistaken for something that Trump would say. His, you know, buy America, build America type plans have a very clear um, inference that you know, China is breaking economic rules and should be held to task. Um, Biden's plan includes a carbon adjustment tax uh, on imports from countries that do not meet certain climate targets. He specifically mentions China when talking about that plan. Uh, there is uh, a lot of the rhetoric, I think, is, is very quite similar uh, to what we would see from Trump. The one thing we know that Biden would likely try and do is rather than use a bilateral stance where negotiating with China on a one-on-one -on -one basis, we know Biden instead wants to create a coalition of Western, uh, Western economies, Western democracies to try and in conjunction pressure China to change its economic, uh, its economic policies and its security policies. And so under Biden, you may see a different orientation, a different style, perhaps more consistent, less likely to change by tweet, but not necessarily a complete reversal in the U.S. stance towards China on, a, uh, on an economic and security and tech uh, perspective. And so maybe a different style, uh, but I think the orientation of the U.S. relationship with China is not going to change on a dime uh, under a new presidency. But what about Europe? I mean, the president has also, you know, had threats of auto tariffs, you know, tariffs on wine. Now we have this Boeing, um, this ruling from the WTO that, you know, Boeing subsidies mean that they can put tariffs on the U.S. Uh, does Biden cool any of that off or is it the similar, just same approach, but different style? So we don't, ex as I said, we don't expect a hard reset in the relations between the U.S. and China. We actually do expect a lot closer to a real reset in relations with Europe under Biden versus the current relationship under Trump. John, as you mentioned, uh, President Trump has been quite antagonistic towards Europe on an economic perspective. At times, he's called them worse than China in terms of their, uh, you know, in terms of trade and protectionism. And you know, the the fight over aircraft manufacturing subsidies that's something that's probably going to continue. It predates the Trump administration. It's likely going to continue under Biden, if he loses, it'll continue if he wins as well. Um, that's something that I think is gonna continue kind of below the surface. But the higher level threats of overarching tariffs, whether it be auto tariffs or, you know, concerns about the Brexit negotiations, how the Trump administration's relationship with the UK impacts its relationship with the, with the European Union, those kinds of issues, I think that are prevalent under Trump, are likely going to basically go away instantly if Biden were to win. 
because one of the things we know is that Biden wants to strengthen the economic relationship and strengthen the security relationship with the EU as part of his quest to unite Western democracies to try and force, um, you know, try and force changes from, uh, from other economies, including China. And so we think that a lot of the economic antagonism uh, between the U.S. and Europe that's accompanied the Trump administration likely goes away under Biden. And so from that perspective, you actually do see the possibility of a real reset in relations. The threat of auto tariffs probably goes away under Biden. Um, and so I think that could mean that Europe ends up being a relative winner uh, from a change in the Trump administration over to a Biden administration. So speaking of resetting relationships, the, the UK is in the process of resetting their relationship with Europe. Um, I'm not even going to try to speculate where that goes over the next couple of months. How does the Brexit negotiations and you know the perhaps a change in the White House impact the speed at which the US could secure a trade deal with the UK? Well, certainly we're coming up on crunch time, both in Brexit negotiations between the UK and the EU, and also we're at a crunch time moment for US-UK negotiations because the possibility of a change in the president, as you mentioned, could have a major implication for the relationship down the road. Under Trump, I think there's a desire to get a deal done. We know that US trader, uh, USTR Lighthizer um, has been uh, quite positive on the prospects of a deal. But there's a sequencing issue that really matters here for the UK, which is that there are certain issues that the, U the US wants to negotiate more favorable stance with the, EU with the UK, excuse me, but they can't quite do that until there's certainty over the UK's relationship with the European Union. So for example, something like food standards, um, whether or not the UK is willing to accept certain, uh, certain agricultural imports from the US over food standards, it's hard to commit to anything with the US when they still have to work out their relationship with the European Union. So from a sequencing perspective, it's you no, know, obviously we're only a couple of weeks away from the election right now and we don't have a deal in place, uh, but it's, it's looked for a while now that because of the sequencing issue that it would be difficult to secure a pact before the election. After the election, if you get a Trump victory, I think USTR Lighthizer is likely to stay on and the negotiations can continue as they are. Obviously, the negotiations between the UK and the EU are a significant input there, and we really have to have that issue resolve itself. Certainly, that's outside the scope of this podcast to discuss the intricacies of that discussion. But nevertheless, there's a sequencing issue that you probably have to allow that relationship to, to you know, those, those negotiations and talks to, to sort of continue before you can get a real deal between the US and the UK. Under Biden, I think it opens up the possibility of further delays. Um, the U.S. trade representative who leads the negotiation is a Senate-appointed position. And so certainly under a Biden presidency, you'll have a new U.S. trade representative. I don't think that's a position that's going to be filled immediately. Um, there are a lot of cabinet positions that I think would take priority. So Biden would come into power in January, should he win in November. There will be, you need to confirm a new Treasury Secretary, you need to confirm a new Secretary of State, you need to go through this process of putting the, in, you know, putting the individuals in place, getting them through Senate confirmation, and then kind of bringing them up to speed. And so that probably means you get a delay in negotiations regardless, even if you don't even consider the fact that the U.S. negotiating um, their desires, you know, their, their, uh, what the U.S. wants to negotiate might end up being different under Biden. So from that perspective, we think that there's a possibility of a clear delay um, if you do get Biden, because it represents the possibility that you have to kind of restart a little bit with a new set of negotiating goals from the U.S. side. One last thing to mention is that both the U.S. under Biden, if you were to win, and the U.K. have both expressed at least some interest in trying to rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, and so there's a possibility that the U.S. and the U.K. find themselves into a trade deal some point in the future if both of them find their way into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Obviously, that's something that's way down the road. The TPP has become somewhat toxic in the, in the, in the Trump era. It was the first thing he did when he got into office, pulled the U.S. out of those talks. And so I don't think that's a near-term consideration, but it's certainly something over the longer term as we think about the U.S.-U.K. relationship. 
Yeah, so I think that just kind of to sum all that up, um, and I think one of your points there about the Biden administration needing to come in and, and get all those appointments in is, is important because, you know, whether you're talking about just a different approach to China, but still relatively, um, so let's just say unfriendly, um, or a more friendly approach to Europe and all that, you know, there is a good chance that under a Biden administration, even before some of those um, discussions start to take place, you're going to have a bit of a honeymoon period where, you know, the, the trade front, the geopolitical front can probably be a little bit more quiet, um, which, you know, should be supportive of markets, I think, uh, especially on, on the China side, even if it does deteriorate down the road. But in any case, that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to talking to you again soon.